Hello, everyone. So this is a lecture about cryptographic hash functions. So let's start by talking about what hash functions are. And let me say from the outset, they're not encryption. Uh, we learned that uh, to encrypt something is to add a key and transform it. And uh, if you have the key, you can decrypt it and transform it back. Hash functions are not like that. They're one way. Once you hash something, you cannot get back with or without a key. So simply stated, it's not intended for confidentiality or anything like that. It has something else in mind. So what are they exactly? It's, as you can see, it's really a mapping has a domain, it has a range. The domain is infinite. You can hash anything you want, whether it's a number, it's text, it's a videotape, it's a bunch of pictures, whatever it is, you can turn it into an array of bytes and hash it. The codomain of this function is really tiny in comparison to the size of the domain. Domain is practically infinite the range or the codomain is a fixed number of bits, 100 bits, 200 bits, 300 bits, that's it. So clearly this function is many to one. Uh, there's no way to have it one to one if it maps everything to a sequence of n bits. Uh, to be a good hash function, it has to be very fast. Uh, you can compute it by software or by hardware very quickly. So it boils down at the end of the day to a bunch of XORs, uh, simple logical operation like rotation of a sequence of bits, ending, oring, something like that. And the fact that it doesn't, it's not one-to-one, -one, it doesn't have to be bijective, it doesn't have to be reversible means you can find any function you want, like you take a bunch of bits and you pick some of them or you end all of them. It's okay because you no longer need to bring it back. And another requirement for a hash function is that somehow it digests the entire thing being mapped. Uh, we call it a digest. So in other words, that uh, if you hash something, and then you have something extremely similar to it. For example, has the same bit sequence, except one of the bits is flipped. Uh, it shouldn't be likely that you will get an answer uh, similar to the original. So a single bit flip should result in half the bits of the image change uh, to result in an avalanche, right? So we had a similar requirement in encryption, but uh, this one is even more because reversibility is not an issue for us. So to get a feel for that, uh, just fire up your terminal and just issue the command in Linux and issue the command SHA-1 sum, SHA-256 sum, MD5 or something like that. So let me do that. Um, let's, uh, let me go to my terminal screen and take a command like MD5 sum. Uh, you can give it a file name if you want to hash that file or you just type anything you want. So let me say, hello, York and and the input with control D as usual. And it gives me this 64-bit creature. And that is the, the hash using this particular algorithm, MD5 algorithm. Let's do it again and say, hello, your, and put an exclamation mark at the end. Now look at this hash and compare it to the hash I got before. Almost everything changed. Remember, every hex digit here represents four bits. And 
just compare the two and you will see a completely different hash. Similarly, you can go with the SHA-1 um, sum or hash. That's bigger, that's 160 60 bits and give it something like hello York and see where it takes you. 160 bits here and I can do it again with uh, with an exclamation mark at the end. And again, you can see uh, the difference between those two. So the gist of the idea is whatever you give me, you end up with the same size uh, for, the, for the digest. So back to the, uh, what is it? Back here, uh, you can see that uh, uh, we have these three properties for a hash function. Uh, I'm sure you've seen uh, hash functions before, but not in the context of security, but in the context of simple data structure. In the case of Java, every class has a method called uh, hash code. It inherits it from the root uh, of the object hierarchy. And it somehow uh, takes the instance of that class and turn it into a, a unique number, right? A long integer in the case of Java. Uh, but uh, even in any language, there's a data structure, a data representation method called the hashing, where instead of storing the data uh, based on how it uh, was obtained one by one based on a particular order, a sequence, if you like, in an array, or in random locations in memory linked somehow with a with a with a pointer, just like when you do a linked list or a tree. Another alternative is to hash the data and turn it into an, into an integer, and that give rise to give rise to representation like hash maps, hash table, uh, Python they call it dictionaries, where given the key, which is the hash, you can retrieve the data. All right. So we use it in data structures as well. Now, uh, in terms of the Java cryptography extension, uh, invoking or computing the hash is really straightforward. Uh, there's a, a class called message digest. And uh, from that class, there's a static method called get instance, and it gives you a unique, it's a singleton pattern. It gives you a, an object called, uh, we called it MD here, and it's based on the algorithm you like. You want SHA-1, you want SHA-2, you want uh, MD-5, and so on. Here are the algorithms that are typically used. Uh, MD-5 is rather old now, and it's weak, uh, because uh, it's only 128 uh, bit. Oh, a moment ago I had, I said 64, MD5 is actually 128 bits. And uh, SHA-1, 160, there's in the SHA-2 family, shown in purple here, there's 224, 256, or 512 bits. SHA-3 is a recent entry. It comes in 256 or 512. Actually, you can extract it in various other sizes as well. Uh, the data that is being hashed is as we did in encryption, it's typically partitioned first into blocks with each block uh, hashed separately and then the hashes combined somehow, depends on the mechanism. We will see them later. Um, so the point is, once you have this object reference MD, you invoke the method uh, digest and you pass it the object to be hashed as an array of bytes. We saw that for a string, you can just say get bytes and you will get them for uh, a big integer. You can also turn it to an array of bytes for anything else. 
surely it can be represented in memory as bits, and you can read these bits one byte at a time. You get an array of bytes, and that gives you finally the hash. Once you have the hash as an array of bytes, um, you can turn it into a hex string if you want to send it uh, through some channel and so on. So it's very easy to compute the hash um, in Java and most other languages. As you saw in Linux, it's just a command line. Open SSL is another command. All languages have one way or, the, or another through a library to get you a hash. Now, hash functions, uh, as used in data structures and elsewhere, are fine. But to be a cryptographic hash function, we need more than simply hashing the message into a small bit sequence. And there are three properties that we look for. You need to meet one of them in order to be a respectable cryptographic hash function. Which one you need to meet? Well, it depends on the application that you're using the hash for. So the first property is called pre-image resistance or a one-way property. I'll use the word one-way in this course uh, when I want to refer to this property. And the property says that if you are given the Y or the image or the hash, it's not possible to find any data point that hashes to this Y. In the picture here, I have X1 as some, something to be hashed, and it hashes to this point. And given this point, you cannot find the, the, the data point that led to this, to this hash. Now, one thing should be clear. Since the function is not bijective, right, it's obvious <laughs> that if I give you the hash, you won't be able to find the first one. That's, that's taken for granted. But the key word here is any. So if I give you the hash here, you cannot find any point that, that leads you to it. And that's the difficult, that's the challenge. That's the strength, if you like, of this hash function. So if I, if I know the hash of a password, let's say, just by looking at the hash, I cannot predict the password, uh, this password or any other password that has this hash. I cannot even glean some properties of the, of the password. Uh, does it have eight letters? Does it have 20 letters? Is there any pattern in it? No, it blinds it completely. And knowing the hash gives me no hint about the data, the original data that provided this hash. This is a property that I need. Uh, clearly, this is something I would want if I want to store the hash of password. Uh, looking me as a site administrator, I have access to the hashes. And the hash itself tells me nothing about the the password itself. Another completely different property is called the, the second pre-image resistance. The first one is called the pre-image, knowing the image, how do you can reverse it? The second property is that even if I give you an X and its hash, you cannot find a different X with the same hash. So in the picture down here, if I give you X1 and its hash, Actually, I only need to give you X1. The hash itself is public. You can simply hash it and find the image. Uh, so anyway, given this X1, you cannot find another one that has the same hash. By the way, in this or the previous problem, when I say you cannot, I don't mean it's impossible for you to find one, but it's really difficult to find one. You need a lot of computational power to find the other one. Uh, it's never impossible because I can try each and every <laughs> possible X and I keep hashing them uh, till I find one that collides with the original. But uh, the, the, given that there are infinitely many points here, there are infinitely many pictures, many strings, 
uh, there is no limit to what can be, you know, to the various things that uh, can be hashed. So let's just call it infeasible. It takes, let's say, 20 years continuously running a cluster of computers to find another one. That's infeasible. That's the scale we're talking about here. In this course, I'm going to refer to the second property, not as second pre-image resistance, but rather weak collision resistance. So that's how we will call it. The third and last property is strong collision resistance. And it means you cannot find any pair of points that have the same hash. So it's not like I'm going to give you one of them and tell you, find me another. I'm just going to give you the entire domain and the hash function H and ask you, can you find me any two points that have the same hash? If you can't, then this hashing function is has a strong collision resistance. So one more time, the three properties. The first one says, I give you an image. It would be infeasible for you to find any point in the domain that has this image. The second one says, I'll give you a point in the domain and it's hash and you can't find another one with the same hash that collides with it. And the third one says, you can't find any condition <laughs> easily. So just by giving you the function, you can't find any two of them. Uh, do not get the impression from this ordering that I'm giving them, I'm giving you the three properties with increasing strengths or anything. The relationship is captured by the Venn diagram here. As you can see, strong uh, S, the strong collision resistance, yes, is included in the weak. So if it's strong, it implies weak, all right? However, the one-wayness uh, property, which is the difficulty of getting a pre-image, uh, really intersects with D. So as you can see from this diagram, it could be one way and neither weak nor strong. It could be weak and uh, neither one way nor strong and so on. So that, that captures the whole thing. And as I said earlier, it, it really depends on the application of the hashing. Uh, for storing passwords, one way is obviously the thing you want to do. Uh, for uh, things like blockchain or for bidding, and then all what you want is the weak property, all right? That it's difficult to come up with another data point that collides with a given one, right? If you're storing pictures in a database, you want to make sure no two of them uh, are likely to have the same hash. So the, the strong property would be important to you. So it really depends on the application. All right, so now we know about hashes, why do we need them? Uh, well, we need them because we started with the objective of CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And we've been focusing uh, exclusively on the C, the confidentiality. We covered that. Now we wanna move to the I. So the first question that comes to mind all these ciphers that we studied, whether they are classical, symmetric, asymmetric, stream, block, and so on, public key or shared secret key, uh, do they provide the integrity? And if so, why do we need to talk about uh, a third building block, which is the, the hashes? So what do we mean by I integrity? As I said, integrity is an umbrella term. Right, not all textbooks, not all papers talk about the integrity uh, with the same meaning. So let me be clear. To me, the word integrity, the integrity of a message, means that the content cannot be falsified, cannot be fabricated. If Alice sent a particular content to Bob, when Bob receives it, he should be able to see the same content. All right, so you cannot fudge 
the message. The sender integrity, also known as authentication, it means when Alice receives it, she knows that Bob sent it. All right, it's not like somebody else masqueraded as Bob. Sender integrity. Sending, the act of sending is part of the integrity, which means can Bob deny sending it? So I received something from Bob. It looks like it because uh, he signed it or something with a signature or he said, hi, I am Bob. Uh, can I, uh, I mean, differently from saying I know who's the sender, can Bob deny sending it? Can he repudiate? All right, this is really important. For example, you, you made an order for, for certain goods from an online site and you receive the goods, but then you say, I'm not paying for it because I never ordered it. It just popped up. So you deny uh, the, the act of sending. Finally, the time of sending, right? I received a message now from Alice. Did she send it now? Or maybe some somebody in the middle replayed the message that Alice sent five years ago, right? And I forgot about it. Now I received the message. It looks like it's fresh. It's coming to me now. So all these have nothing to do with confidentiality. Whether the 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 message will come in the clear or encrypted, that's not the point now. The point is, do we have integrity vis-a-vis -vis those four different aspects? And the key question you, you should ask yourself as a review of encryption, does encryption cover this? All right, symmetric or asymmetric? Does it provide integrity? And generally speaking, the answer is no, right? On its own, without any changes or additions or without the third building plug, which is hashing, the answer is no, it does not provide that. And uh, I can go through some of the cases, but I invite you to do so. Uh, given what we have seen in terms of the malleability of the XOR function, in terms of the attack on IV and the first block in the case of CBC, uh, go through the various uh, requirements for integrity here and ask yourself if the message is encrypted. Is it guaranteed that the content cannot be fudged? Uh, they can't take a block from one of them and replace it with another, maybe garble a block so that they can send any ciphertext uh, and uh, change the one that follows it. Uh, repudiation is another point. This is the act of sending. Even if Alice and Bob have a secret key, that nobody else on the planet knows that key. And if Alice received the message from Bob encrypted with that key, then you would think, yeah, Bob cannot repudiate it because look, I'm Alice, I received something encrypted with that key and only Bob knows it other than me. Uh, still, uh, if he denies sending it and I go to court and uh, I present the evidence, look, it's a message encrypted by Bob. How could he not have signed it? Uh, Bob can say, oh, I created this message. Since I know the key, I can create it. So he can still repudiate. So go through the various possibilities. It's a very, very good uh, review of encryption. And you will find that in some cases it can. Uh, provide some some of the integrity uh, requirements, but in most cases, no. Uh, let's see how hashing can help. Use case A takes a message, all right, hashes it, and then and sends the message and the hash to the uh, to a unit that combines them. Remember when we put these two, two pipe characters next to each other, it means we combine the two. Uh, typically we concatenate them. You don't need a separator. Maybe there is an agreement that the last, I don't know, 
200 bits of the message is its hash, or you can put a clear separator with a special character between them. One way or the other, you combine the original message with its hash. The combination is then encrypted with the key. Uh, this is an example of a secret key shared between Alice and Bob. So we encrypt it with the key and we send it. The shaded figure here implies that Eve intercepting this will see nothing. Nothing in plain text is shaded, it's encrypted. So it's encrypted here with the key K is the message concatenated with the hash of the message. Upon receipt, Bob will apply the decryption function and remember he knows the key and that yields the message itself and its hash. He will take the message and hash it. Remember the hashing function has no key involved in it. So it's just a public function. He applies it to the message and compares the result with the hash that came with the message. If the two are the same, then no change could have been done here. Uh, if a change was done to the message, the hash won't, <laughs> won't match. And if the change was done to the hash itself, then the message won't hash the same thing. So one way or the other, this uh, this gives us uh, a content integrity. All right, changes along the way are uh, detectable. Use case B, uh, we take a message and hash it as before and encrypt the hash. So rather than encrypting the concatenation of the message with the hash, I'm only encrypting the hash here and sending. So the message is sent in the clear. Uh, confidentiality is not my concern here, but I sent an encrypted hash. Upon receipt, Bob would decrypt only the hash. The message is available in plain text. He would hash the message and compare the two. So this is somewhat, somewhat similar to the original, but uh, confidentiality is not, a, is not a concern here. Ask yourself if Alice can repudiate, either in this case or in this case. Uh, if she can say, I never sent you anything, you fabricated it. Use case C is similar to use case B, uh, except we were, we're gonna use asymmetric cryptography and encrypt the hash with our private key. So Alice will encrypt E with her private key and send. Upon receipt, uh, the message is hashed, whereas this ciphertext is decrypted with Alice's public key, which Bob and everybody else knows, and the comparison is done. This also ensures uh, the uh, integrity of the content, and it adds more to that. Uh, now difficult for Alice to repudiate sending uh, because we received the hash encrypted with her. <laughs> Here's the general framework uh, in which hashing is used for content integrity. Uh, this is a very important slide because um, it shows the various terms used and it's really important to differentiate those terms when you think about hashing. The word digest is used to, in the same sense as, as the hash. So when I tell you compute the hash of a given message or a given picture or a given piece of data, it's the same as me telling you compute the digest. Other terms are sometimes used. They say, what's the tag of this piece of data? What's the checksum? Or what is the random function, the pseudo random function of it? They all mean the same thing. And we will use in this course, the word digest to mean simply the hash of the message. A Mac on the other hand, a message authentication code is a digest encrypted 
with some symmetric cipher. So in the previous picture, in use cases A and B, uh, we found that Alice, not only she computed the digest, but she also encrypted it like this, encrypted the digest with a secret key shared with Bob, and that produced the Mac. HMAC is a very interesting variation on the Mac, all right? In it, I mean, the gist of it is similar to the Mac. I wanna hash the, the message, and to ensure nobody can tamper with the hash, I'm gonna encrypt the hash or somehow blind it or make it difficult to, to change using some key. But rather than encrypting, I'm going to add the hash, uh, add, sorry, the key to the message itself. And typically the way it's done is they take the key and from it, they derive two separate keys. One key, which is key two, is simply concatenated with the message and the result hash. And the final result is concatenated with yet another piece of the key and the whole thing is hashed together. This is the, uh, the algorithm for the HMAC, all right? Um, it's, it's very interesting because the use the use of the key is different from the way we're used to because we're used in encryption. If you give me a key, I incorporate it in the function that performs the transformation. And then I get the cipher text. Here, you take the plain text, which is the message and embed the key in it. So the key appears, you know, let's say at the bottom of the message and then you hash everything together. And in the case of HMAC, after you hash, you also uh, append it with, or prepend it in this case, with another key and hash the whole thing again. So in effect, uh, the, the key is part of the plain text being hashed, being, uh, is part of the plain text rather than part of the transformation. The transformation is always H, and H is some hash function. Whereas here, when you encrypt, it, the, the key plays a key role in how you encrypt. Whereas here, the key is just added to the thing being uh, hashed. Um, why is HMAC sometimes preferred over MAC? Well, I guess for one thing, you're relying on the, you are not relying on the cipher, on the encryption cipher. And sometimes, for example, you use DES, and then a few years later, they tell you that DES, uh, somebody found a weakness in it. AES, somebody one day may find a weakness in it, or the uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standard, will adopt a new standard. Uh, then AES, and suddenly you are using something old or something weak or something with a known vulnerability. Relying on hashing is usually safer because hashes are simpler and their strength is really based on the size, their size. So if you have a hash which is 512, for example, uh, then it's hard to find a vulnerability in it uh, because really attacking it relies heavily not on the algorithm, on weaknesses in the algorithm, but simply on exhaustive uh, attacks that try everything possible within its uh, size. And if the size is big, it's suddenly infeasible to, to attack something like this. Another advantage of HMAC over MAC is speed. Encryption, all encryption types are way slower than, um, than hashes. So HMAC is another candidate on the table. Finally, there's the word signature. And signature refers to also, you take the hash of the message and you encrypt it, except you encrypt with your private key. So here, 
This is the asymmetric version of Mac and HMAC. Here we use secret keys, whereas in signature, we use a private key. So in the case of RSA, you take the hash of the message and you raise it to the uh, private exponent, uh, mod uh, N, and that gives you the encrypted hash. And that is called your signature. Notice that your signature now is dependent on the message. So unlike the word signature, which is used in English to denote some, some marking that encapsulates you, now the marking encapsulates you, uh, D, and the message. So when we say, uh, I have a signature um, for a particular message, it means it's unique to that message. If the message changed, right? Uh, the, the signature supplied with it will not go with it. So it's a signature per message. Uh, okay. I'm going to pause here. All right, so that's about content integrity. Um, let's now tackle the other uh, integrity issue that's raised and that's sender integrity. How do I know if I receive something from X that it was really sent by X? This is also known, known as the authentication of the sender. This can be done in one of three ways. Uh, the first is relying simply on symmetric cryptography without doing anything. So no hashing is involved here. Uh, as long as the key is not leaked, is known only to Alice and Bob. And if Alice received a message from Bob and it decrypted correctly, then it must be that Bob sent it, all right? No freshness is involved. He may have sent it yesterday, <laughs> right? So it, it has nothing to do with freshness and he can still repudiate. He can claim that I fabricated it. But if it's just the issue of uh, verifying that I received something from Bob, yes, symmetric cryptography without any hashing will give us that, all right? Another option is to use challenge response. And it's a very interesting idea. And it goes like this. Alice will create a nonce, a number used once, uh, maybe a secure random. Uh, she somehow got a number like seven, all right? Uh, let's say she wanna send it to Bob. So she, sent him the number seven. He returns to me the same number seven encrypted with uh, the, in the case of uh, secret symmetric crypto, uh, the key shared with us and he sends it to me, all right? He can also do an HMAC, which means he combined the seven with the key shared with us and hashes the result, right? Once I receive it back from Bob, then first I know it must be Bob who did this thing because only me and Bob know the key. So how did anybody else know how to encrypt it or how to etch Mac, all right? But also it gives me freshness, okay? This is not something that Bob did you know, five years ago, because I just came up with the number seven out of the blue. And if it's unpredictable and it's really a nonce, uh, it, it's not easy to imagine somebody faking this. So that's a step beyond doing just symmetric crypto, all right? And once I receive this, I can also send the, uh, Bob 
some uh, 7 plus 3. I mean, we'd have to agree on some function that's applied to the 7. Uh, for example, square it, add 3 to it, something public. There's no problem there. And let's say I agreed with Bob that I'll always add 3. So the next time I'll send 10. And, uh, or he can send me in return a separate month and I'll do the same. So I can have mutual authentication this way. All right. Um, this will give us freshness. A different approach is to use asymmetric cryptography. I also come up with a, with a nonce like the number seven, but I will encrypt it with my private key and send it to Bob. Right. Uh, this, uh, this ensures that I sent it, and if uh, he replies uh, similarly, um, I, I would uh, I would be assured that uh, he sent it. So it gives us freshness, the same idea as challenge response, but I'm using asymmetric. But the the the, the, the advantage here, the byproduct of using asymmetric, is the non repudiation. Since the private key of Bob is not known to me, uh, obviously, if he signed, if he encrypted anything with it, it must be him. He cannot deny that. In terms of the time integrity, all right, how do I know that something I just received from X was sent now rather than it's a replay of something that was sent before? One option is to have sequence numbers. That means when I send you the first message, I call it message one. When you send me back, you call it message one. Then I send you message two, and then you send me message two, and so on. It's a huge overhead. I guess if it's just the two of us, it's not a big deal. But if I'm a server serving 5,000 people, then I have to remember, oh, for this particular person, it's message number 28, for this one, it's message number 5012 and, and then so on. It will add overhead on me to remember, but it would work. Ideally, this should be incorporated, this counter in the protocol rather than in the message itself. So if we just delegate this issue of keeping track in each session uh, of the sequence number, then it would be nice. And that would ensure freshness. Uh, if I know that the last message I received from X in this session was 28, and the one now that he sends me is three, then it's a replay of some old things, right? Uh, I mean, the sequence number has to be incremented by one each time, not by two and not by minus seven, right? So that's an approach to ensure freshness, ideally within the protocol. Another form is, simply date the message, put a timestamp on it. So whenever Bob sent me something, he can incorporate the time and the date uh, at which he sent it uh, in the message itself. There is an issue here with synchronization because replays sometimes happen not uh, from a year ago, but maybe from seven minutes ago. Right. I mean, there's a, an ongoing session between two people and a replay can happen of uh, something that occurred just a little bit before this instant within this session. So if I'm going to be very picky about the time of the transmission and the time of the receipt, I would now start worrying about the synchronization of my clock and Bob's clock. Right. So it would be good to have an agreement between me and Bob that, uh, I don't know, every 10 seconds, he gives me the time of day and I give him my time of day and we agree to adopt one of them, all right? Or both of us would uh, you know, derive our time of day from a third party server, a time server. But then there is another issue of network delays because the time server could be closer to Bob than me, then there could be a few microsecond differences between us, and this small time will increase uh, over time due to some delays in clocks and stuff like that. So there are small things that you have to worry about, and definitely this should be part of the protocol, not the message. 
A third approach is to use what we did in the previous slide for freshness, which is challenge response. It not only assures me of the sender, but it also assures me of freshness. So challenge response is probably an innovative and very smart way of doing things. And I can do it at the message level myself end to end, or I can have the protocol. I think IP Secure uses that and a number of modern protocols adopt challenge response at the networking level, so I don't have to think about it uh, in the message, uh, in my message. Uh, hashing is actually uh, ubiquitous. Uh, it, uh, its application go beyond messaging. And uh, the way we, we were looking at, we were looking mainly at the integrity and the confidentiality of a message, right? But it goes way beyond that. So I'm, I've selected here a few applications of hashing that we will, um, you will often come across uh, when, when you deal with the hashing. First one, obvious one, software download. Uh, I wanna download a piece of software. We do that all the time from servers. And we wanna make sure that we have received the software intact, unlike messages where you know, if something got garbled, you can figure it out from the rest of the message, from the context. Uh, if somebody fabricated something, yeah, there is a chance you can detect that because it doesn't make sense to you. <laughs> but when it gets to programs and machine language bits flipping, then wow, the, the, the software will behave differently than <laughs> how it should be. So it's really important to have content integrity when it gets to software downloads. So what do they do to uh, secure that? Uh, they simply send the software in the clear. There is no encryption there, but they post the hash of the software, the entire executable file on their server, which is a read-only server. So in that case, what I should do if I'm downloading a program, first download it to you, then run the command to compute its hash and compare this hash with the hash posted on the website. If they're not the same, you know that uh, some noise or some uh, malicious third party changed the software along the way, maybe embedded a virus or a bot or something in it. So it's a very easy way to secure the download not for confidentiality, but for content integrity. Second application has to do with best practice for storing passwords. Uh, all servers, as you know, store your password so that they can authenticate you when you log in. But how do they store the password? Uh, initially, oh, back when things started, they used to store the password in a password file. And the danger in that uh, is that somebody may hack the server, get access to the password uh, file, and suddenly that person would know your password. They can masquerade as you. They can, um, uh, and if you use the same password as most people do for different servers, then suddenly they can even, you know, hack your account on other servers. Even if nobody hacked the server, the administrator, uh, perhaps he was uh, bribed into leaking the password files, he was uh, blackmailed into doing this, or maybe he was fired and he is disgruntled, he leaked the password file. So there is a lot of <laughs> vulnerabilities involved in storing the passwords as plain text. So, a much easier way is to store only the hash of the password. So in the password file or database, I know the username of the person, and I also know the hash of their password, not the password, the hash of their password. And with the one-way property of cryptographic hashing, uh, given the hash of the password, I have no clue what the password is, all right? So that's, I think what everybody does, what everybody does or should do, I should say, because often I hear of leaks as recently as weeks ago 
of sites being hacked and the password uh, access, right? Well, they shouldn't be stored on the site anyway. Uh, anyway, if you if you only store the hash, then once you log into the site without even going to disk, the program in memory will hash your password upon receipt, compare it to the one stored on disk. If it's the same, all is good. Otherwise, uh, the authentication is rejected. Uh, typically, by the way, to ensure that the password is big and random and so on, they add, they blind the password. In other words, they add to it a big uh, string of random uh, random bits. They call them the salt or the blinding uh, part, and they hash the whole thing. Uh, this makes the password bigger without you having to uh, to memorize it. Um, anyway, uh, the the key point here is not to talk about rainbow tables or how big the password should be. No. The point here is hashing is a very important tool for password storage, another application. A third one is indexing or fingerprinting, even in HTTP for caching. And it relates not to messaging, but let's say you have a database of pictures. You wanna store all your pictures somewhere. Well, how do you index those? Like typically we'd like to have an index that allows quick access and searches to the, to the database. But now, uh, how do I do that uh, if I have pictures or videotapes or something that is not easily searchable? Well, the easy way to do that is to have a hash. So not only I store the picture, I also store its hash. So in the future, if you say, Here's another picture, I can hash it, and I can say, wait a minute, this picture is already in the database. I did not compare the two pictures pixel by pixel. I simply compared the hashes and detected the equality. Uh, fingerprinting, you know, in a crime scene, they took pictures of various evidence and so on, and they wanna store it and archive it uh, for others to see in the court or something. How do we ensure nobody tampered with it, right? Uh, unlike text, sometimes it's really hard to discern changes in a picture. You know, at the edge of it, one pixel was, <laughs> was dark, it became light or so on. Hashing is another way. So that's another uh, bloom filters uh, come to mind as example for indexing and searching uh, blobs in a database. Next application is online bidding. It's a beautiful example of zero knowledge. My ability to show you that I know something or I have something without revealing it. Uh, let's say there is uh, an auction and people can bid on a certain object, but the bids are secret. So it's not like I bid $5, you bid $7 to buy that thing. No, all the bids are secret. We submit our bids and after it, the deadline has passed, they open all the bids and the highest one will get the, will get the object. Well, how do I know that the, the administrator of the auction will not uh, look at the bids? And if he sees that the highest is 50, he or his friend will bid 51 and they will get the, they will win the auction. Well, the easiest way is for me not to send my bid, but to send the hash of my bid, all right? Uh, in that case, looking at the hash, the administrator wouldn't know uh, what's the bid and he wouldn't even have an idea whether it's high or low or near a hundred or a thousand or 700. That's the one-way property that's needed in this case, all right? And typically, again, the, the bid is salted or blinded uh, to ensure that nobody can, um, uh, can change it after the, the deadline has passed or also to, to reveal anything about it. Anyway, that's a nice application. A blockchain uses this 
uh, blockchain is a way to ensure immutability in a ledger. And it's done like every bunch of transaction. Every transaction, let's say, occupies a block in a linked list. And to ensure that nobody can change any part of it, each block contains the hash of the one before it. So if somebody tried to make any changes in uh, the one before it, it will be detected because uh, the, the link list will lose the, the connectivity between the blocks, right? And you can't even change the one before it because it has the hash of the one before that and so on. So it relies heavily on the on, on this. Uh, mining, uh, to do mining, to add a new block, right? Uh, they You need to add a header containing a a particular none uh, to ensure that the hash of the block has some constraint. For example, it starts on the left with two zeros or three zeros. Uh, putting a constraint on the hash, uh, like you hash something and the result has to be, let's say, between 12, uh, it has 12 bits, uh, all zero or all ones at a particular location. Uh, there's no way for me mathematically to ensure that I only can hash and try and try and try until I come across this. Mining consumes a lot of electricity because of that and involves heavy parallel processing uh, to keep hashing various trials until I hit the constraint. So that's another example of hashing. All right, this last slide has a bunch of exercises, go through them and uh, we can discuss them offline.